then it looks like we're ready. Very good morning. So today I will actually talk about OptimSoc, which is a project which allows you to build your own system on JIP. I am, and you can see it on the slides. By the way, can everybody understand me? It works? Yes, looks good. Um, I'm studying in Munich. I'm doing a PhD there, and that's where actually all this work comes from. So it's uh, rather academic for what we use it right now, but we'll actually show you how you can use it and what components are in there and everything. Just to start, everybody knows what a system on chip is. Do you? Just raise your hand if you do. So, okay, perfect. So there we are on the same line for the first. Um, what I will talk is about many core system on chip. So who has heard of that before? Just raise your hand again. Okay, that's not everybody. So the question is, what's that, and why are we doing it? Let's start with the second question. Why are we doing it? Why is the traditional way of building system on chips, like we have done for a lot of years now, is not sufficient anymore? On the left, we see this guy with the nice glasses. That's Gordon Moore. And now you know, kind of, well, Gordon Moore, you know this graph. So this is Moore's law. And the end result is we have a lot of transistors that we can put on our chip now. So the question is, what do we do with all those transistors? The Moore's law states actually we have around twice as many transistors every 18 to 24 months. So we need to actually scale our way we develop chips in this area. So we need to, we're actually able to build chips that are twice as powerful, maybe, every two years. Well, the reality looks different, obviously. So we're looking for a way of building chips that is scalable, that uh, builds chip out of reusable parts, so you don't have to start from scratch every time you do a new chip, which is definitely not what you want to do. And then the more transistors you have, the more chances of error you have. If you have like two and a half billion or five billion transistors, there's pretty likable that some of those will fail from time to time. And also not maybe just one transistor will fail, but a whole area of your chip will fail. So if you're building chips and you want to use them for a couple of years, you actually want to build them in a scalable and robust and reusable way. So how can you do it? What's the ideas we can take from the past and then I found this nice picture, which has nothing to do with electrical engineering. This is a Roman mosaic from 2,000 years ago, a bit more. But there you can see the basic concept that we will actually apply to building our chips as well. This mosaic is built of small pieces that individually all look the same, so a lot of white pieces and a lot of different colored pieces. And out of those, you can build a really nice large system. And this stuff is actually pretty scalable. If you want to build it larger, just put more tiles, small pieces next to it. If you um, actually, it's pretty robust as well. If one of those tiles, small pieces fails, your floor is still okay. It's not like build of huge bowls. And if one of those fails, you actually drop on the floor below you. So this sounds like a good idea. And that's what we did. And that's what other people do as well. So these tiles are our basic building blocks for our system on chip. And right now you see every small square here is a tile. This looks pretty boring because those tiles all look the same and they're not connected at all. So let's start at first, actually put some colorful tiles there. Why not? And since we are not artists, at least I am not, that's what you can see here, uh, we don't have tiles that just look colorful. We have tiles that actually have different functions. And here I have a couple examples for functions. We have compute tiles, which contain a processor core. We have, for example, here a memory tile, which might contain some memory, obviously. And you have the red or orange ones. For example, here would be accelerator tiles, some video decoding, some DSP, some uh, hardware, crypto, whatever you might want to put in there or whatever your application actually needs. So now we have this structure of tiles. We obviously need some connection. 
And traditionally, and probably everybody knows that, that's here in the room, the traditional way of connecting pieces on a system and chip is using a bus or interconnect, just like Wishbone or AX, uh, AMD, no, AXI, something like that. Uh, so the AMD stuff, and there's different ones as well. For those tiles, we use a different way of interconnect, which is called network on chip. And those ideas are actually just taken from the regular networks you have at home. They're here, the gray areas are routers, and the lines are just interconnection lines. So you have a system that has a lot of tiles, and you have routers with each tile, and those tiles are connected to each other. In this example here, we have a mesh network, so this is the whole connection in every, so there's connections between every router in every direction. This is nice because it gives you a kind of a scalability really easily. It also is rather robust because you can imagine that if like this link fail, or let's put it this link fails, you can still go the other way around and still go there if your routing algorithm is intelligent enough. But this is a lot of overhead as well. You have a lot of wires, you have a lot of routers, you have actually a lot of buffers in those routers, which is usually the most expensive part on a system and chip is memory. So there is other way of doing that. You also can do it in a ring and it might not look like a ring at first sight, but it is. It's an electrical engineering artist ring. So it goes this way and it goes up again here and so there's no connections in here. So you have like kind of a ring connection and it works with the same principle, just looking a bit different. So those ideas are not really new. And you might have heard of that. That's the Intel SCC was published in, I think, 2009, end of 2009. So this was a research project by Intel to build exactly such a tiled system on chip. And you can see this is one of the marketing slides of Intel when they announced it. You have here routers, you have tiles, and they're all connected in a fashion like we've seen before. This one actually, and it says it here, it has 24 tiles. Each tile has two processors, so that's a 48 processor on one chip. Those chips were never really commercially available. They were a research project, and I think they built like 100 or so of those and shipped it to researchers around the world. And today, what we can get of this research that Intel did is that parts of the ideas that were used there are available in Xeon Phi, which is now commercially available and used as accelerator cards for some use cases. <coughs> Let's go on. There was a Kickstarter project like one and a half year ago, a bit more over a year ago. That's a small company in the US, in Michigan somewhere, I think. Uh, they're called Adaptiva, and they're building this chip called Epiphany, and this is well, this was supposed to be an eight times eight mesh, and you see the structure is the same again. I think what they're shipping now is a four by four with 16 cores, um, because it obviously takes a lot of money to manufacture chips at all, and so they had some financial problems, but I think they did it now, and they're about to ship in first part of this year somewhere. See the same structure again, it's regular structure, and I think you can buy one of those boards for $100 was the Kickstarter project. Another company that's rather famous, they're called Talera, and they're building, again, you see the same structure here. They have a different interconnect, and they're actually putting a lot of more effort and have a lot of more money available for that, and they're in the market now for quite some years. So the question is, if they do it, why can't we do it? And the, the reasons for doing those systems sounds at least reasonable if you see the, the scaling and everything that's in place. So if you want to do research on those or want to actually build your own chips and there's not that, it's not that hard, you need some basic components. And that's actually what OptimSoc provides and that's what I will tell you about today. So OptimSoc is the open tiled, you've seen what that is before, many core system on chip. And for those of you who have never heard many core, it's just a marketing buzzword of we're larger than multi-core. Um, so that's actually nothing special, it's just marketing. 
but you need to have some marketing, obviously. So what OptinSock is about is building blocks to build your own many core system and chip. It's not about a production ready solution. It's not stuff that you can actually buy and put in a chip and, and solve all your problems. This would be a bit too easy and otherwise I wouldn't be here, but rich. Uh, so we will have a look into this bag of components that OptimSog is and provides. We have different components. Obviously there's tiles and that's the basic components that you need to build such a system. And just before we get uh, into all that, all those components I will show you are written usually in Verilog. Is everybody familiar with that? Just raise your hand. Just your hand. Okay. So because I'm not, I'm asking those questions because I'm not completely sure of the audience. There might be just too many software developers who have never heard of that hardware stuff. So just to make sure. Okay. All those components are very log. We have in those compute tiles, a couple cores. You can configure how many you want. Those cores are open risk CPU cores. And up until a week ago, I think we used the old open risk cores, which are the OR1200 cores. Since a week ago, I think it's published that we used the MR1KX, that's the new implementation of the same instruction set of the open risk cores. So they're actually instruction set compatible. You can use the same compilers and everything, just the implementation is actually a bit at least easier to read and to extend and everything. Those are not by ourselves, they're coming out of the open course project and they have a lot of very uh, intelligent people working on those. We actually needed to extend those cores because the MR1KX as it's built right now is meant mainly for a single core use. So we had to extend it a bit so there is a new, whoa, some earthquake happening. We have a core identifier, so each core gets a unique ID, and that's put in a register. You need that actually to, for the core itself to know who he is. It's rather important. We have some, we have a compare and swap unit in there, so after level one cache, which you need to implement mutexes and other things. And we have some scratch memory for each core, because otherwise you just have one local memory. So. There is not that many registers usually in the um, open risk, so we have some scratch memory actually to extend that. The picture here says it, you have a couple cores, you have a local bus connecting the, the level one caches, and you have a local memory that all those cores access. And then you obviously need to communicate with the world outside you. You have a network adapter, and I'll go into that in a second. You recognize here there is no level two cache, there is no level three cache, no level whatever cache. There is this core, its whole is a distributed memory core. So there is no global sh coherent memory shared among the tiles, but they're individual. There is, however, a shared memory version that we have around, which is partly working, but not completely. Shared memory turns out, well, is a rather large problem, especially cache coherency. If you want to get that right, it's not that easy. And we've seen like in the parallel stuff before, they don't have even caches. Uh, the Tylera one we've seen before put a lot of, lot of effort into cache coherency of the whole system. As it said, this is right now distributed memory and this is good enough for a lot of use cases. And as I said, there is a shared memory version and I'll say that a couple times. Most of the work we've, I'm presenting here was done at the university, was done by students that did very low coding for the first time. So there is a lot of code around, which is not really ready to be published. So if you want to get started with that stuff, talk to us. There, we can give you, obviously, the code. That's no problem. But we don't want to publish it right now, because otherwise you'll yell at us what crappy software we publish. And well, it's there, but you need to put some work on it. It's like staging, staging, staging tree. Good, to the network adapter. The network adapter is the main bridge between the communication that happens in those compute tiles and the, oh no, the computation that happens in the compute tiles 
and a communication which is done over the network on the routers. There is two ways of communication in those uh, network adapters. There is a DMA engine which allows you to grab some memory pages from a memory tile that's somewhere available and put them in the local memory. And there is message passing support for which is our preferred way actually of communication. So message passing is support is rather easy, it's fully asynchronous. You write into a buffer, it gets sent out to the network eventually. There is new messages coming in from the network. They go into read buffer and you get an interrupt on the processor if there is a new uh, message available. So this is like the easiest way of message passing you can think of. We have been talking about the memory tile just before. So let's see how that looks. Memory can be like in two ways. There's uh, SRAM and DRAM, and we support both with different kind of ways. There is, for the SRAM, you have a network adapter which does the DMA again and does some other things as well. We have a, a wishbone wrapper, and then you can connect just regular SRAM that you can find on an FPGA platform or in simulation or whatever. So those components are usually already available, and they're already most of the time coming with the wishbone uh, adapter, so that's pretty nice. For the DRAM, you have again the wishbone wrapper, and then you actually need to talk to a memory controller that's provided by your um, IP provider usually, so that's like a Xilinx memory uh, controller or whatever you have on your FPGA chip. So um, with those wishbones wrapper, and you can find those memory controllers can be usually found on open cores or something like that for the um, platforms that are commonly in use. So you can get started really quickly here. You don't need just memory, you need I.O. as well. And you find here a series of really state-of-the-art interfaces that we support. So that's UART, that's SPI, and there is the most famous of all, the LCD dot matrix display. You figure out this is not meant to be like real I.O., there is no hard disk I.O. or anything. That's not the point of the whole thing. Um, the I.O. is just actually to get some status information out. It's not uh, usually the point of those systems actually to do real hardware access. Or so you have support from like a larger core or something like that in there. Uh, by the way, what you figured out, you are this really hard protocol. Not because the protocol is hard, because there is so many different connectors that you can find, male and female and crossed and whatever. So for people like us that are used to Ethernet connections that always work, we actually needed to buy a real big box of different connectors around, just to be prepared for the strange ideas others have. So going back to the real stuff, and that's actually where the fun starts, and that's where you can actually do most is accelerator tiles. You can use this tiles concept and put any tile in there you want. And they co communicate over the network. That's rather easy. The network protocol is really, really easy. And you can use it for CPU offloading and whatever you want to do with, like put a DSP core or we have some work actually done doing a um, crypto core there which does some crypto uh, calculations. We have been talking about the network, so that's what it looks in a kind of buzzwordy way. For those of you who have actually heard of some or seen some implementations of networks on chip, this is the most common way actually of implementing those. It's a mesh or a ring, we have seen this before. It's uh, wormhole based, it's packet switched, there is dimension routing, so there's no deadlocks, which actually, so dimension routing means if you have seen this mesh before, it only works for a mesh, obviously, you just go in one direction to, the, um, to your connection and then just go down. So always go left or right and then down, not just randomly. This doesn't give you real nice robustness features because it always, the packet always takes the same direction, but it's really easy. And there is, the buffers are configurable in the routers and there is support for virtual channels. There is other features this, that are not 
really listed here. There is support for uh, multicast. There is support for bufferless networks. And there are some other things like dual cast and stuff like that, which are again available but not really production ready. And as it turns out, if you want to put all that on an FPGA or something like that, the resources, especially the interconnection resources, are very, very limited. And things like bufferless looks really nice on first sight, but actually it's taking a lot of buffers as well. They're just not in the routers, but they're in the network adapters then. Or for multicast, the implementation really gets really, really tricky and large. So you end up with those features, kind of routers that are half of your chip size, and so you're not winning much at all. So it actually turns out for small, that's what we actually figured out for small um, structures like we have right now, it's int more intelligent just to send your packet a couple times before you do a multicast implementation in your routers. This obviously changes as soon as you scale. So those features are there. If you want to work on those, just get in contact just the regular way. I have been talking about target platforms and FPGAs before. So what target platforms are actually supported? Where can you use OptimSoc? And this is three main targets, like usually are pretty common. You can do RTL simulation. You can do the whole system on an FPGA board. And I have the one that we usually use here. Or you can do FPGA emulation. And I'll go into details of all of those in a second. First, the RTL simulation. Who has worked with ModelSim or some other simulation tool before? 60% or so? For all of those, you know, you, get, you can use the real hardware, get insight into the hardware at signal level, which is really nice. You can see what's happening on the bus. You can see what's happening between the cores. You can happening, see what's happening actually in the instruction pipeline. Wherever you want to look, you can have a look. It's really fast turnaround time, so you change something on your code. You recompile it with ModelSim, and just takes a couple seconds or maybe, yeah, usually seconds, and then you have your changed stuff. Obviously, there is downsides as well because there is no free lunch usually. It's rather slow, and I mean, it's really slow. But anyway, you can get really nice insights, so that's usually what you do first when you do new code and just to test it. There is another tool called Verilator, and who has heard of that? Just raise your hand again. Whoa! This, so ModelSim is commercial software. It's sometimes available for beer free, but usually not, especially for larger designs. Verilator is a tool that takes your Verilog sources, compiles them into C code, and then the C code gets compiled by a regular C compiler. So you end up with a um, runnable system that is just regular, a regular application on your uh, PC. And that runs a clock cycle accurate um, simulation of the real hardware. This is rather fast. It's much faster than ModelSim. It's free software, but it's not as accurate, obviously, as uh, ModelSim. So you just get cycle accurate simulations. But uh, it's really nice if you're doing system level design, if you want to actually test software that runs on those systems, you can do that rather easily. And the other problem is you don't have that much insight into the system. It takes a bit more effort actually to go down to the signals because most of them are optimized out just to get the speed up. And there's a third option I just mentioned here. That's Icarus Verilog, and I'm sorry, I've never used that. It's a free software. It should be, from the idea, basic idea, similar to ModelSim, so it's a regular simulator. The problem is if you're working in academia, everybody has access to ModelSim, and in the industry, it's just the same. So we've never tried uh, Icarus Verilog, so it's guess it's up to you to try it. But it, in theory, it should work. Obviously, simulation is nice, but not really a solution. So we want to go to some real hardware. And real hardware in this case is soft hardware. 
real hardware we obviously cannot afford, and I guess most of you cannot afford either. So what we use is FPGA boards, and we use those FPGA boards not to put some custom logic on the FPGA, but actually to put the whole system and chip on the FPGA. There is two boards we mainly use. One, and I've shown that before, is uh, this one, this the Zetex uh, board. It has a Spartan 6 FPGA like Xilinx on it, and a nice use, well, not so nice, but reasonably working USB connection chip on there. So on this system, you can get six to 10 CPU cores with the network on chip and everything on there. So this is a rather good start. The same is true for this, and this board is rather common as well. It's distributed by Xilinx to all universities, but it's also sold as a regular development board for a couple hundred euros. Uh, so it's known as ML505 or as XUP V5 for the university version. We are, as you see, rather Xilinx based because this is the tool flow we're actually used to. We have been experimenting with some Altera FPGAs as well. So there is the DE Nano Zero, I think it's called. So this should be rather common as well. Um, so we started on that, but didn't really have the time to get into all the Altera flows. So in theory, it should work. Try it out. And the third thing I've shown before is the um, the FPGA emulation, and I don't think you ever have access to one of those machines. Yes? You have access to it? Very nice. So you can try it out. It should work. We have the Chipit system by Synopsys. So those emulation systems, for those of you who don't know, are systems that put a, together a lot of FPGAs and form kind of a virtual FPGA, which then can be used to prototype your system, and you can and those systems actually exceed the limitations of just having one or two FPGAs or where you can just get like 10 cores, you actually can build like 100 cores on those machines. But it's, again, it's, there is some downside and that's usually speed, so those systems run at a couple kilohertz or megahertz or something like that if you don't optimize it really hard. Very nice, now we got the hardware. We need to do some programming. We need to put some software actually on this chip, which never existed in this form. It's just an image, usually. Uh, to start, like every programmer, you write your own C library and you write your own compiler. No, you don't do that. So we have a ported version of the new lib C library, which is adapted for, which all, there is already a port for the OpenRISC um, course, and we just adapted that a bit to actually work with the multi-core extensions and to work with our system. And we can use the regular OpenRISC um, GCC. You need some form of operating system after you're done with your C compiler and your C library. And there we got some basic support. So everybody, few is probably used to having a full-fledged operating system around. This is not what we have here. We have here two libraries which are really, as the name says, rather bare metal and basic. There is the lib bare metal, which does mutexes, compare and swap functionality, interrupt handling, DMA stuff, timer stuff, things like that. So this is a ex rather small library. It's a couple of hundred lines of code and already allows you to get your first Hello World program actually started on the platform. There is the lib runtime, which does bit basic scheduling, threat handling, things like that. And if you go, want to go up higher the level, there is two APIs that actually are made for systems that are spread out, like those tiled systems. One handling communication, and the other one handling tasks that are spawned on a different uh, tile or on the same tile maybe, so you can actually give work to other tiles. Those two APIs are the MKP and the MT API uh, by the Multicore Association. We have a rather working uh, communications API implementation. We have a not working anymore implementation of the task management API. So it was working, but we changed some stuff on the system, so we need to do a lot of that again. Anyway, again, if you have 
questions just ask. Uh, there is Linux support being worked on, and this is not done by us, by, but by uh, some people in Hong Kong. They're um, working on a Linux implementation, but uh, they said it will take them some more time. So they're expecting conservatively end of 2014. Let's see how that turns out. Definitely looking forward to that. So how do you do programming? It's easy. That's the Hello World program that actually is shipping in resources, so that's just hello world. And that's the make file that comes with it. And that's also rather easy. So the point of that is actually to show not that the make file is extremely easy, but OptimSoc actually comes with all the build infrastructure need. There is all the linking scripts you need to build your uh, system and software for your system. You actually can start get started really, really easily. It's like a board support package for your own system on chip. This actually turns out to be usually the really hard part, get the linker stuff ready, get the vector tables and everything in order. So this is what OptimSoc comes with, and this is what makes OptimSoc so easy for you to get started. Anyway, if you're programming, you need to do some debugging as well. And there is a lot of terminology around with the term of debugging. I, myself, use debugging as kind of the category. So and then there's below that there's run control debugging, so that's breakpoints, stop, and uh, go on. And there is tracing. So tracing is not the opposite of debugging, but it's part of it. Op uh, OptimSoc only supports tracing, and this is actually by design, because this is the only scalable way across different clock domains and across large systems that actually can work. There is hardware support for tracing in there, so it's not non-intrusive. You don't change the software you're running when you do some tracing. There is obviously, because if you trace everything, you have a lot of data. There is filtering and some compression in there. There is some basic modules that do this tracing. There is instruction traces, obviously. And there is also some software traces. And who has heard of the ARM STM? They're part of every ARM. One, two, a couple, very nice. So this is actually those software traces. That's what we do as well. This is a, gives essential, you essentially a way to put some statement in your software, compile it, it gets executed by the compiler, uh, by the processor, and actually in this execution flow, you just take out some debug information and put it out over the debug channel. This is how we implement it for most of the part of printf you've seen in Hello World before. And this is also how you can put some other events in your software that actually get shown on the user interface later on, and I'll show that in a second. We also have some information about the status of the NOC, like the buffers of the router and things like that. And what the other thing you can do over this uh, debug system is initialize your memories. We've seen there is this distributed memory system, so you need to initialize the memory of every compute tile individually. Very nice. So this is the basic idea, what the debug system does. The implementation actually looks because we support simulation and we support real hardware. Depending on what you have, the connection to your um, debugger or whatever that might look is different. So for this hardware, this has a USB port, so we use the USB to get the debug data out. If you run the whole system in simulation, we use a TCP implementation that just uh, puts the debug information over TCP. All this is handled by one communication library that's called libOptimSoc host. This is done all the encapsulation and stuff like that, and the higher level applications actually don't need to care about the, if the system actually then runs in hardware or in simulation, you just connect the same regular way with your debugger and you're done. There is two way, kind of front ends for this uh, debugging or for the whole system control, there is a graphical user interface, and there is also a command line interface that actually has the same functionality, and the command line interface can also be scripted using Python scripts, so um, you can do memory initializations or uh, tests that you do repeatedly can actually be scripted. And I'm sorry for all the hardware guys, we didn't use Ticket there. Don't laugh, that's the most common scripting language in all those uh, tools. And so this is a couple of screenshots of the user interface. 
and I'm not sure if you actually can see it, but at the first screen you can select how you're connecting to your system, and I can show you, yeah, we can then zoom into later on. Um, you can choose how you're connecting over USB or over TCP or whatever you do, and if you connect, the system actually gets discovered, it sends a unique ID, and we have a database that actually shows some um, known systems that we have built, and for all the systems we have information how they look, and this actually shows you this graphical view here. This is a two times two system, a rather small system, with uh, memory in there and some compute tiles. Then you get actually a list of what's available in the system and you can load the memories here and start the system. So this gets you started uh, rather easily. As soon as you start your program, you get some information about the software traces that are sent, so you get that here. And then you get here the information that's print on standard out. So that's the print apps we've seen in the software before. You get those in this uh, user interface as well. And then down here, and this rather looks boring right now, but I can show you a picture that's more interesting. Those are sections that you can define. So you can use this software trace functionality to define your section. So right now I'm, I'm in a computa computation section and you send an event here and then you send an event later on that right now I'm uh, actually doing updating of some variables or something like that. So you get a graphical view what the uh, process and the systems are doing. This is uh, rather nice for debugging actually for showing how you improve stuff or not. So there, we've seen before, this is the Hello World example we've seen, and you see here four cores, each with a ID, uh, core ID. You've seen some timestamp, because all the messages that go over the debug knock are actually timestamped to be able to correlate them later on. And you see the output of the printf. So that's very, very easy to get started. Now, what can you use OptimSoc for? And this is a kind of a difficult question to answer because I don't know what you have in mind. I can tell you definitely what we are doing with it. You, we are doing, obviously we're a university, we're doing research on those architectures, and we're doing research usually on the hardware architecture part. So we uh, try to figure out what is the most intelligent way, obviously because it comes from us, we already know what the most intelligent way is, uh, to put the tiles together, what's the, how you uh, actually want to put the routers in there, what's the connections between the routers, stuff like that. How you want to organize your caches and things like that. So that's what we do with it. For you, like the easy part that definitely can be done, if you have an FPGA board around, you can use OptimSoc as a really good um, starting point to put some processor cores on it, to get the, all the infrastructure around it, and actually put some processing on those FPGAs. You don't need to put a lot of uh, CPU cores in it, like one or two is already sufficient. That works really nice for many cases. And the thing is that what we use OptimSoc for as well, you can look inside a system and chip. That's what you usually can't do on a ready system that you buy but uh, you can use the, run the simulation and look inside. So, get started. The code and documentation is on OptimSoc.org. It's, um, for most of it, MIT licensed. There is some additional code that we integrate that is different licenses, so have a look, but our code is MIT licensed. Uh, there is also some documentation. There's it's actually not that bad, it's really good to get started. The deeper insights uh, is usually up to you. Um, but you should get started really easily. That actually concludes my talk, and there you see the great LCD display driver here at work. And as I said, a lo lot, lot of the work actually was done by students, so they're listed here. Thank you for your attention, I'm ready for questions. And, yep. We have another one as well. I don't have sound. I have sound? Okay. Hello? Um, yeah. Can you give us a rough idea what 
number of cores can you get on a given size of FPGA, say 35,000 gates, how many CPU cores will you get there with all the overhead for routers and stuff? I don't have the numbers at mind right now and I don't want to give you wrong numbers. Um, I can look it up and give it to you. So you can actually, if you look up the Spartan 6 that we shown before, you can get um, 10 cores around on there with the network. So just divide it by 10 roughly. But I don't have the numbers of gates in, at mind right now. But I'll look it up and get back to you. There's another question. What would you expect from programming languages to support such systems like message passing or such features? Um, so on, on the software side for message passing support. Yeah. So this direction goes more into the wish list area of what I would wish. Um, so that, that's a difficult question. <laughs> so it, the ideal thing would be actually not to see it and that's what a lot of things actually go into the direction. You go from a model and it builds the, the whole system by it yourself. Uh, essentially, so kind of the, the, the data flow graph. So you go from different uh, processor cores and uh, strip your communication. And then you don't see the message passing at all. It's just used. So this sounds like a way that we might go for some solutions. And, but, well, explicit message passing is not that hard. So I, I don't know where the programming language research actually or stuff goes in this direction. I don't know. So no real wish list here. Are there more questions? There yeah. is one. Um, if you put your system on like a Spartan 6, what kind of clock frequencies do you I'm achieve? I'm sorry, I don't hear you. If you have the system, for example, on your Spartan 6, what kind of clock frequencies can you achieve? Um, what we're you? rather conservative because we don't care too much about the clock frequency right now. We run those with 50 megahertz, so 50. Um, you can go higher. You can go to like 100 or 150 if you really optimize it, but okay. that's not what we're done right now. Okay. No more questions? Okay, then I would thank you. Thank uh, you. With a very promising project.